Thank you both for being here. Tom, let me start with you just in terms of the reaction that we have seen in the markets yet again today. It's the seventh straight day of declines. Does this make sense to you? Uh, it, it does make sense. And, you know, I could compare this, Shauna, to the euro crisis of 2011. And what the market's grappling with is an inability to quantify the risk moving forward. So as you had in the euro crisis where people were afraid that country by country would leave the eurozone and couldn't quantify the global economic implications, we're having a similar problem here. The good news is here, I believe, we'll have the ability to quantify the risk much sooner than we did in the euro crisis. The euro crisis required Draghi to step in with his bazooka and say, no mas, we'll do whatever it takes. I think here, what's going to happen if you're short, uh, watch out short sellers, because you could wake up one morning and they could come out and say, listen, we know the Gilead drug works anecdotally in China. We know that it's worked in, in different cases around the world. We have 10 more days of late stage testing right here in the US, but we're gonna make it available for patients on an informed consent basis. If they said that tomorrow, the game would be over. You know, you've got your, the, the market was set up coming into this trading at 19 times forward. I think we talked mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was due for a pullback. We got a, a pullback plus, but I can say one thing, Wall Street is the only place that they offer a clearance sale and no one shows up. Well, I mean, yeah, if you put it that way, then I guess there's always opportunity. Dan, when you see the market behaving like it has been over the last seven days, I mean, taking a look at some of the names today, Caterpillar, that's a bellwether, really, just for uh, global growth, that's sliding over 2%. Does this worry you at all? Um, it does a little bit. And I, I really can't focus on the market a whole lot itself, but I can talk about the economics behind it. First of all, it plunging so far so fast makes me think that there's a lot of fear built in that, uh, you know, that, that could bounce back to a certain extent. But I do think it is reflecting uh, some economic fundamentals. Um, you know, we were really were kind of set up on this already. Um, and that's why we've been saying for the you know, for a while that we could see a flat or even a negative quarter in the first half. Because if you look at the underlying economy, even though a lot of people thought it looked good on top, there's a lot of things underneath that aren't quite so great. For instance, there's all kinds of stress in the labor markets. Um, the uh, wages have peaked. Job openings are plummeting. We have transportation and manufacturing already in recession. And our old friend, the yield curve, was still inverted in October. And I still believe that's a good indicator. And here we are. So it's like the market, the economy was set up for one more thing to trip it. And I think that's what's happened. And I think maybe you're seeing part of that in the stock market because now there's a realization that earnings are going to look bad too. Well, Tom, when we talk about what we're seeing in the market, just taking a look at the VIX alone, hitting a high of just over 49 today, that's a serious spike really over the last couple of weeks. When, you, when we see that type of fear in the market, is do you think that there is a bit of an overreaction there? I mean, I know you're talking about before just in terms of the uncertainty, and we could see a bounce back at any time. But when we see the VIX this high, that's a little bit of a cause for concern. There's no question. But hi historically, uh, and to Dan, who had, had talked about the yield curve, mm -hmm. historically, when the yield curve inverts, which it did in August, uh, the last three times, you've had 18 months until the final market peak. So we're only you know, uh, a third of the way there, a little bit more than a third. So, so we have some time. Credit is still available. Liquidity is available. We've had over $400 billion of liquidity pumped into the system since August of this year. Uh, on balance, I, I think there's, there's opportunity out there. When you see the VIX trade, trade to those levels, you know, do you go all in and do you be reckless? Absolutely not. But you start to build. And, and when I say nibbling, you start big, or at least that's what we're doing. It's not a recommendation. Mm -hmm. But you start with the big, safe, large cap companies that are, that are just trading, you know, uh, American Express, for instance, it's down like 30 points this week. You know, do you, do you know, as you look forward to his point about earnings, earnings in the last week have come down a dollar and fifty cents. So they're going to come down more. Q1 is going to be a wash. But once that you get that quantification moment, whether whether it's a drug, uh, you know, Singapore is already back to work. So mm -hmm. it took China like two or three months to contain this and the new cases to come down, Apple to open 85% of its stores, Starbucks to open its stores. Singapore got it done in like five weeks. They, they run like a well-oiled machine. And I think in the developed world, you're gonna see it also run like it ran in Singapore. And then people are gonna say, okay, I get it. And then particularly if you have a drug that people can feel comfortable, like, oh, my odds are extremely low. I'm not gonna cancel my plans because worst case scenario, the minuscule odds that I get it, I can take this antiviral and I'm fine. And then business will be back. And, and that might take, you know, that, that's certainly, you know, Q1's a wash. 
probably half of Q2 might be a wash, mm -hmm. so it is going to impact to Dan's point. But once you get that quantification moment, we're going to look through, and you know, next year you're lo looking at it. You know, $190 uh, of earnings for the S&P 500. Dan, what do you think the Fed is uh, closely watching, just in terms of the fact as to try and to gauge whether or not they need to act, and if they need to act as soon as their meeting in March? Um, well, I think that uh, they're probably actually talking to the other major central bankers around the world and looking at this and thinking, you know, maybe if we cut rates 25 basis points, even between meetings, that could calm the financial markets and everybody else down. It won't do anything to help the uh, the macro economy, but it could be uh, soothing the financial markets. And that uh, I think the Fed has developed a third mandate over the past couple of decades of making sure the financial markets uh, uh, do well and don't collapse so much. So I'm pretty sure we're going to get a cut in March. We might even get a coordinated action before that. All right. Well, we'll see. Only a few weeks away. Uh, Dan North and Tom Hayes, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me.